Okay, so here's version 0 0.8. So it's the biggest single update we've had in SP Tools up to this point. So there's 16 new objects, three new Max for Live devices, and a ton of change stuff under the hood. But the, the flagship stuff, this one is signs, um, synthesis and physical modeling, and documentation. So I'll kind of walk you through each of the bits. But before I do that, I do want to say there is now an SP Tools Discord server. So um, the link is below and maybe on the screen, I don't know. Um, but go ahead and join in here. You can get uh, updates about what's coming new, uh, make suggestions, share music you've made or corpora and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, a Discord server, so get up on that. So yeah, SP Tools, um, I'm gonna have the change log here in the background. I'm gonna kind of walk through bits as I go because it's quite a lot and I wanna make sure I don't uh, kind of miss anything, but here we go. So first up is a new descriptor type. So now we have signs or sinusoids. So um, what that basically is, is when you feed audio into it, you get um, a laced list of frequencies and gains. So um, by default, it gives you uh, 32 voices. So you get 32 of the most prominent sinusoidal components and their respective gains. So in and of itself, that's kind of cool. And there's some kind of musical examples that you can do here. So um, something like this. So it's useful for kind of doing resynthesis stuff. So in this case, I'm sending hang drum samples into it and then analyzing those sinusoidal components and then playing them back so we get this kind of spectral freeze type sound. But that's being made up of the resynthesized components. So um, like all the other uh, descriptor type objects, we have the frame based version. We have the um, kind of all in one um, real time version. I'm sorry, all in one version. So it's just one object um that spits out uh you know everything at once and also does its onset detection triggers and gates and all that kind of stuff um you can do the multiple input types if you're using a sensory percussion pickup and all that kind of stuff and you also get a real-time version so like all the other descriptors it, it, it follows the same paradigm so with this one you get all of that uh the musical example here is i think a little different So you can kind of do some funky stuff with it. Um, but as this being a new descriptor type, I analyze it with all the corpus based stuff. So you should go back and analyze, uh, reanalyze all your corpora because then the corpus analysis file will have the signs built into it. At the moment, nothing from the corpus's uh, playback is using that, but it might in the future. But it's, it's nice to have that as just kind of a comprehensive thing. So that's the first thing in that like, I needed that to enable uh, some of the other things coming up. So some of the new things here we have, I wanted to add some, some things that generated sound. So there's a lot of stuff of sample playback and um, the mosaicing and all that kind of stuff, but I wanted to include some kind of synthesis and modeling type things. So there's a couple of strong um, patch that was like in a bunch of the different health files. So I kind of went in and put together like a, a really pimped out car plus strong. So now there's a native SP car plus. <laughs> So it's really good for giving you all manner of kind of plucked um, string type sounds. And you get a lot of uh, different parameters here that you can tweak. One thing that's kind of nice with this is that you have control of, um, you know, algorithm parameters, but then you can control it either with like the synthesized impulse. So this is generating this kind of impulse shape that you can kind of shape and control and it'll impact the, the kind of timbre of it. Or you can send it um, audio input. So here's the same algorithm, but being triggered by the audio that's coming from there or a combination of the two. So you can kind of like balance it out and, and kind of get, um, activate the, the, the Carpus Strong algorithm with a, a little bit of a kind of a sassy thing. Um, and here's just a musical example doing it. So it's creating a baseline and then doing a bunch of, well, have a listen.
So you can see you get some kind of really interesting wave shapes from it. And this comes from, I mean, I'm putting a little overdrive on it on the end, but there's a, a bunch of parameters in it that you can really tweak and get some quite nice sounds. In this case, I'm doing it with some probability-based stuff, but I'll explain that in a moment. Um, maybe I'll jump to the next of the um, new instrument thing. So that was car plus all right, resonators. So one of the things that I was able to do with having these sinusoidal components is um, do a, a resonant filter bank. So this object is very similar to the Sinmat um, resonators object. In fact, I started off using it, but I didn't want to have add dependencies. So it's like a, a home world version of resonators that sounds very similar, but is not exactly like resonators. But what this is, is you give it audio in and it, it's a resonant filter bank of a bunch of bands that um, gives you something that kind of sounds like a physical body. So um, there's a bunch of the kind of, not famous, but the, the Sinmat models that come, you know, with the, the resonators thing. So you get like these different tones. And like in the Carpola Strong, you have a bunch of parameters here that lets you tweak um, the impulse going into the algorithm to tweak it. And whether you want input or the impulse, like similar things that I showed with the Carpola Strong. Now, a nice thing with this is that you can load your own model. So you have, there's a U menu that comes with it. So you have like all these that you can kind of load. Um, some of them sound cool, some of them sound, you know, they have different sounds in and of itself. But you can also just give it a, a list of frequency gain and decay rate tuplets. So this is something you can find lists of this stuff online, or you can just kind of make up numbers and, so that's the sound of that one. Or you can load models that you've trained yourself, which I'll show you in a moment, so is a model that I created using an analysis thing, which I'll show in a second. So here we have the same kind of thing as before. You can tweak all the parameters for the impulses. You can do whether you want the impulse, uh, input or the impulse or a combination thereof. So this is a theme that you'll see across a lot of the physical model ones where you can drive it with an, its own internal impulse or with your audio input, um, which can give you yeah, a bit of an expressive thing. Um, and in this one, I have three models loaded up in this musical example. There's kind of a bass, so when I'm playing like dark or quiet sounds, it'll be doing the bass model. Um, and then there's a using SP filter um, whenever the sounds are loud, so above 38 dB and bright, so above 90 um, of centroid. It's going to play randomly one of these two models over here, and there's a probability object that's doing that. So that gives you this. So in this case, I mean, you can't really see it from the thing, but basically as I hit the rim of the drum or use the, the sort of sewing needles I think I'm using in this audio clip, um, those sounds will trigger the one model, whereas if I play the skin of the drum, it triggers the other models. One thing that um, this adds here that the Sinmat object doesn't do is I expose a duration parameter. So if I play like one of these, you can kind of make the model sound shorter or longer or wherever in between so that's kind of a a little bit of a spin on it um, as are these other you know the the impulse parameters that are there now with resonators because i have the sinusoidal things you can generate your own models so um here's an example audio file i'm going to analyze so this is what this audio file sounds like so this comes included with it it's a uh, some old little jangly bell that i recorded many many years ago sounds like this Okay, so I've analyzed it using um, resonators create, but under the hood is um, the sinusoids, the signs stuff that I showed a second ago. These are the frequencies that are found. So I'm doing 32 partials here. And these are the gains for each one. So these are the loudest gains and these are the quietest ones. So the synthesized one sounds like this. Which is pretty good. And you can pick however many components you want to synthesize it with. So let's do 16. I'll analyze it again. Yeah, sounds all right. Or eight. Or even let's say two. So that's that sound, but being made of only two sine waves, essentially. Now, the duration that you hear here, you can change in the playback object. Um, what this does, it, it takes those descriptors, the, the, both the, 
the frequencies, the gain, and then it also does a statistical analysis on the derivative, and that's how it gets the balance of how the different frequencies decay. So that's what gives it this um, shape there. And there's a few options here that kind of, uh, depending on the sound file that you're loading, um, sometimes this, but the default setting I think works best on most samples. But for example, if I analyze this, because it's a bell sound, bells have a lot of inharmonic samples or inharmonic sound, inharmonic uh, resonances in it. So if I just analyze without the time centroid on, which I'll explain what that is in a second, it gives me this. which is not a very good representation. Now the thing is all those frequencies are present, but they're probably in the very quiet decay, like the super, super quiet tail part. So what this time centroid flag does, which is on by default, it analyzes the file for the time centroid, which is the point in the sample at which half the energy is before it and half the energy is after. And then uh, when you have that flag enabled, it analyzes the harmonics and all that stuff only in the first half of it. So it's really good to kind of perceptually weigh it. So with a time centroid enabled, and if I want this, I can write this to file, put it on the desktop, this is my little bell, and then I can load this up into the resonators object. Okay, um, next up, we've got a shaker. This one's pretty simple, it's just a kind of like a maraca type sound. You know, pretty straightforward, but you can And like the other ones, you can control all the different parameters, but you can tweak the settings such to make it sound like in this case, I think I do kind of almost a snare type sound with the, the shaker. So I've got the sustain and the frequency as low as it goes and a lot of objects. So it kind of gives a bit of a snare sound. So it's not, not one of the most groundbreaking uh, models, but it's kind of nice to have in the mix for like either percussive sounds or snare sounds, or in some of the examples you hear later on, you can modulate that frequency and get some interesting, interesting timbres out of that. Um, now, another thing that I've done with the sinusoids or the sinusoidal analysis is it lets me do a uh, real time resynthesis on sounds, well, on audio input. So in this case, I'm analyzing for those same frequency uh, gain pairs, but rather than um, training a model, I'm using that to like in real time create uh, resonating little bands. So it's an oscillator bank, but um, with different curves and stuff like that. So that sounds something like this. So for percussive sounds, you get these really weird inharmonic things, but if you fitch, uh, send sort of pitch material into it, you can get these kind of ominous things. So in this case, um, you can transpose the, um, the resynthesis. So in this case, I have it transposed two octaves down um, and it sounds like this. And with these, you can adjust the, the shape, the slope, um, and the duration. So then that'll give you different kind of characters to the, the resynthesis. Now, one thing that's happening under the hood here is that each individual voice that gets um, generated is randomly different. So if I set the duration to here, like if I put this to kind of preset settings. In this case, I think it's doing 16 voices at a time. Each voice will have a slightly different um, duration internally. So I, I tell it 1.5 and they're all ever so slightly different. And the same thing for the slope and shape. So when you see a sound decaying, like the harmonics kind of move in a bit more organic manner. So sometimes when you do like an oscillator bank resynthesis, they all the harmonics do the same thing. And it has a bit of a, a very frozen synthetic sound, which is Cool, it's its own thing, but here it kind of does this. Each one has its own kind of shape, which for my ear sounds kind of cool. Um, with this one, you can do stuff where, one thing to be mindful of this object is that the CPU can get really crazy. If you crank the duration um, and have a lot of voices, you can you can blow up your, not blow up, but you can really get a, <laughs> mind your CPU usage with this one. 
but you can get these very distinctly different sounds. So you can pick the amount of voices and you can pick the amount of brightness, which adds a, uh, a wave shaper to the, the sinusoidal components or the sine waves. So we can have a sound like this. So this is a low voice count, but with high brightness. And now here's a high voice count with a low brightness. So they're both kind of harmonically rich, but they're different things. So like the low voice count is a low amount of fundamentals with each one of those fundamentals having a lot more harmonics. And the other one is more fundamentals, but with little to no harmonics above it. So it's just kind of a different sound. Um, there's a little note here that um, doing low voices and high brightness was in general less CPU. So if that's an issue, um, you can go that way. But this is just there to kind of find the settings that you think sound most interesting. Um, input mode, so you can set up that stuff like with a lot of the other onset objects, <clears throat> or if you can use uh, sensor percussion just for the onsets, but then do the analysis from an air microphone or whatever. It's cool, it, it just makes the resynthesis better. Um, you just get a, a richer information from the harmonics. And then finally, here's a musical example. Um, so in this one, I think I'm doing uh, using a low, a single voice, so kind of a note and transpose down five octaves. So it's almost like generating a bass line. And then I'm using the shaker to do this kind of stereo-y, filtery thing. And then some carpless strong stuff in there triggered as well. So just have a listen. So everything you hear is being generated from that there. So all those like little plucks and plips were the sinusoidal analysis, um, but being transposed. So you get this kind of like almost midi baseline type thing happening from the, the hits. Um, so there's the sinusoids, which is the all-in-one version. And then there's a sinusoid player, which is um, very similar. The only thing is that it's, um, it's its own separate playback unit. So you handle your own onset detection your own descriptor analysis and then the playback. One thing to be mindful of is the signs requires a, a bigger window. So um, it uses delay here. Um, you can also use uh, signs with a little tilde instead, but this is kind of the same. You can do the transposition. Now what's useful about having a separate playback thing here is you can take the output of sign frame and choose to send it or not send it. So um, what's happening in this one, I'm doing some descriptor analysis and I'm using that to feed SP filter. So when the filter is bright, so like, like above 110, so sorry, when the centroid is bright, um, it's gonna trigger this additional really um, high pitched one. So this is almost the same help file, sorry, almost the same musical example from that other one. The main difference here is that we've had those low blippy things, but now there's also this high one. This is coming from a separate thing. So whenever there's a bright hit on the snare, it'll also trigger that um, high sinusoidal voice. So have a listen. see that so the green one was the like when it's a high bright sound and the other one was the other one so that's a sinusoid player so that's what you get if you um if you separate it out you can filter the data coming out of here before it gets to the sinusoid player so it gives you some options there if you want to do clever stuff like well not clever but things like that um next we've got waveguide mesh So um, this is a physical model of a vibrating membrane. The, the maths of this is really kind of beyond my understanding. So I'm just kind of implementing some code that I found, which is all kind of um, commented and referenced in, internally if you want to look at that. But essentially it's using um, delay feedback networks to create something that sounds like a physical 
resonating thing. So it's almost like the resonators model, but instead of being based on a bank of resonant filters, this is based on uh, feedback delay lines. And you can get some maybe more complex, it's a, it's a different flavor. This is perhaps a more modern way to do some of that. But you have things like this. which sounds something like some kind of metallic body that's being resonated there. There's a ton of parameters in this one. Um, it's a little complex. Um, as before, you have your control over the input, um, the impulse. You, here you can also um, send some of the input to the output. So you can hear the impulse as part of the sound itself. Um, Um, so this obviously affects greatly um, the the resonating that you get from the waveguide mesh. And then here I do my best to kind of explain some of the parameters. It is it is a complex thing and I don't fully understand it in terms of like what's actually happening with the algorithm, but you can just massage the numbers and see what you get. With this one, I found that um, the numbers, you kind of massage them around a lot, and then you can find a, a sweet spot where it sounds like a thing, like some kind of object, which is kind of cool. And then for the musical example here, I have um, a version that you can randomize different types of parameters. So essentially you have the nodes themselves, which are like the feedback networks. Those define to a certain extent the, the body of it, I guess, like, And then the other ones affect its resonant characteristics. So um, in this version here, I can randomize different things of that. So I'll just play with that for a second. Or I can choose just to, let's say, randomize the parameters. Um, or just the nodes, which are those things. All right, so this is one of the more complex physical models that are added in. So I do plan on adding some more of these. I think um, one of the things I do wanna keep with SP Tools is I don't wanna add additional dependencies. So it uses Flucoma for the core stuff, but it, I don't wanna add like, oh, and now add this library for this and add this library for that, because it starts getting a little too, uh, a little too messy. So um, I'm, there's a ton of cool physical modeling things out there, but I'm trying to just incorporate ones that I can just build in without needing to have additional dependencies. So as I find more of those, I'll, I'll add some more in. Um, so that's the physical model stuff, but there's also, I've added a low pass gates or LPG. So for those of you who've messed with modular stuff, we'll know what that is. For those that don't, a low pass gate is a, a type of gate as such, but rather than being just the volume on and off, it's also a filter. So as you close the gate, it not only turns the volume down, but it, it rolls off the highs. So it's kind of a bit more of an organic sound or something closer to like what happens in the real world, where as you damp a string, you not only um, kill the volume, but you also like roll the highs off as it happens. So it has a, a kind of a cool thing. So there's a, a vectoral model in here that, that does all that. So um, in this case, I'm just sending noise into it and have a listen. So it has this kind of cool uh, taper to it, like a, a characteristic uh, LPG thing. And then you have some parameters here that you can tweak um, to massage those settings. So I'll just play with them a little bit here. And so on. So it's kind of a, a useful thing to have in the toolbox, which I do use in a bunch of the patches um, and examples as, as you'll see um, throughout the rest of this video. So um, you can trigger it with um, triggers or gates. So if you send it a trigger, it's almost like pinging an LPG. So again, if you're used to modular stuff, you can ping it with just a single impulse and that gives you like this very short uh, attack. 
Now instead, you if you want, you can trigger it with a gate. Well, you can activate it with a gate. So a gate will typically be longer. So it'll be, uh, instead of being one a one sample impulse, it'll be like, you know, however long SP onset detected that you passed the, the threshold. And you just get a different sound. So in this case, you can hear that like the filter is fully open for a moment there. And you can also use and just send like CV or whatever into there or other control signals. So you can put whatever you want. Um, there's different filter modes. So you have like a resonant mode, uh, a nonlinear mode. Um, they, they sound cool and do different things. So in this case. The nonlinear part is, is a little bit more subtle. The resonant one, when you turn it up, you can really get that kind of squelchy thing. Um, and then finally, a musical example here. So this is creating from the attacks kind of a, a bubbly bass line that's going through an LPG, and then a cloud of these um, kind of percussive things, which are also being um, run through an LPG. So that's the LPG stuff. And then there's a separate LPG core, which is just the poly that's needed to do that. Um, I won't go through it because it's not anything too different there. Um, so with that, having an LPG, I it enabled certain kinds of uh, other processes to be built in. So um, there's a bunch of things that I added that are these kind of utility objects. So another one here is probability. So probability, um, you, you can give it a number or you can set it with a probability um, attribute or message, will pass uh, bangs, triggers, gates, messages, descriptors, whatever. It'll take anything as an input and then send it to an output. So in this case, you can see some are um, bright, some are dark. These are the ones that are being passed. So you can see probability um, coming in and you can adjust the probability. So if it's 100%, it always goes there. With zero percent, it'll never come out here. So um, you can send it bangs. So these are some of the examples from the like other help files, but just now with using probability. What's nice is that because it can take any kind of message, you can put whatever you want into it. So um, I can use it for corpus playback. So here I've got a, I've loaded up a corpus, and it's going to pass. Um, it's going to trigger forty five percent of the time. So it's kind of nice, it's, it's useful. So instead of wanting to change, let's say like you want some samples to trigger, but not all the time, instead of having to massage the uh, onset detection and your thresholds and all that, you can leave all that be, but then set the probability later. Or if you want, you can use SP filter to like only trigger when loud notes happen, etc. cetera. Um, and you can also do it in this case, I'm gonna do it with the, the concat stuff. So what's coming through here is a very fast stream of things with a low probability. <laughs> I also mentioned here that it's pretty much identical to the dropouts transformation in uh, SP data bending. The main thing here is that you can also send triggers and gates. Speaking of, here I've got triggers and gates. So this is the CarPlus strong algorithm that's in one of the other help files, but with a probability of happening now. So you can see all the ones that didn't get triggered are those uh, darker ones. in this case with jungly. So 50% of them are going through, which you can kind of see there. And here I'm passing the gate. So the gate is what's getting uh, sent. So you can see that the gate, um, the gate length varies for each of the hits. 
So regardless of the type of message, whether it's a trigger or a gate, um, the probability will open and close based on the message type. Now, um, it also has a second set of outlets for when things aren't passed, meaning that like, so in this first tab here, you can see that, um, you know, these are the ones that are like, yes, it's 50%, this has happened. Um, all the messages will come out the other one regardless. So this can be used to basically pan, create pan things. Or in this case, I've, I've set up two separate uh, corpora here. So the, the China one and the voice one. And there's a 50-50 chance that it's gonna go to one and the other. So in this case, I don't really care if it's allowed or bright or whatever. I, I'm, I'm not wanting to um, send to the different corpora based on descriptors. I just want like 50-50. And in this case, I think I'm panning them left and right, but you don't have to do that. Um, now with that probability, you can actually get some kind of creative things going. So here I'm analyzing for descriptors. I'm using a combination of filtering stuff and then probability. So at the filter level, I'm taking bright sounds. So sounds with a centroid above hundred and the loud sounds. So loud sounds that are above 30 dB. So when that criteria is met, so it's a loud, bright sound, I'm going to come down this path. When it's not met, I'm going to come down this path. Now, after each of those, there's a separate probability. So um, it's gonna come down here and trigger a cloud, which I'll explain in a second, um, and then trigger this piano sample, and then it's gonna do this. And you have separate probabilities for each. Um, so just have a listen first. So it's, it's kind of, you can use it with combination with filter stuff um, or what's happening further down, which is these cloud-based things, which I'll explain in a second. Um, but it, it generates this kind of probabilistic thing going on. So you can use probability. So chance that it'll go this way or this way. And you can use that um, in a creative manner. Um, now with that, there's also a few different ways uh, to process these um, probabilistic things that you've done. So we have a trigger bounce. So this is kind of a, a bouncing ball algorithm type thing. So if I give it just a single attack. So in this case, it's gonna give me um, 12 bounces over eight, 800 milliseconds with that curve. So if I set this to zero, it should be evenly spaced ones. Let me um, turn that down slightly over that period of time. So let's say I want just three and I want it over 300 milliseconds. All right, um, but with this curve thing, you can do either uh, slowing down or speeding up. So in this case, it's speeding up. Maybe put less hits or slowing down. And the curve is how extreme that um, sort of exponential or logarithmic curve will be. You can set it so it re-triggers or not. So if it doesn't re-trigger, it won't go again until um, until the, the first set of bounces has happened. Or if I set re-trigger on, it'll start over the whole time. Okay, um, trigger bounce can be driven by triggers or gates. So if I drive it, in this case, I'm using uh, probability. And then after that, I'm doing, uh, so 50% um, of the time, it'll go into this trigger bounce. And with that bounce, it'll generate this new, um, a unique uh, ramp thing each time that filters just noise. So what we're hearing here is just noise going through a filter and then into a low pass gate. So 
So each time it's randomly, it's going to be always the same thing, but it's going to go through this shape uh, to the filter. So you get this kind of like cool um, thing going on and you can massage these parameters here. You can see it in the background, the, the, the shape of the function that gets generated. Um, or I can drive it with gates. So um, this one here. Okay, so whenever there's a bounce, it's um, playing back a piano sample and then transposing it down an octave with each so like each of the 10 hits. So I think it's starting two or three octaves up and then just goes down an octave until it's like five octaves down. Um, and since it's a gate, I'm using that to then trigger this envelope shape. And you can see that the sort of the gate length varies with each attack. So the way that trigger bounce works is whatever the gate length was of the first attack it gets, it will play each subsequent bounce with that same gate length. And that kind of makes sense. So if you have it set to um, very short and a lot of bounces, uh, the gates will overlap. So it'll just kind of be on for a little bit. In fact, yeah, like with this tiny length and that many bounces, you can see it's just on because the, the all the gates overlap and that makes sense. Um, and then finally, a musical example. So this is combining a couple things. We've got a probability of doing a 20% probability of doing this um, synthy bounce type thing. And then uh, functionally 80% of the time, it's going to go to this um, kick snare thing. And then there's a baseline as well. So this is using a bunch of uh, the bounce stuff and the probability stuff. And I think each one of these has the low pass gates in them as well. Okay, and a counterpart to trigger bounce is trigger cloud. So whereas uh, trigger bounce creates like a kind of a bouncing ball type pattern, either getting slower or faster, what trigger cloud does, <coughs> you instead give it an activity amount, like how busy you want it to be, and a rate. And a rate is how the maximum time between each of these things, and it'll just kind of create a cloud of events based on a single input. So if I give it a single attack, I get this kind of random, series of events after. So in this case, I don't have discrete control over the amount of attacks like you do with the bounce. I just tell it uh, like 40% busyness or if I set it to like a lower number, it's kind of less stuff if I set it to a higher number. And it'll go on for an unknown amount of time. So basically it'll do kind of probabilistically internally. It's like, am I going to do another attack? Am I going to do another attack? And then the rate is the longest time it'll allow between those. So like with the other one, you can use it to, um, with triggers. So in this case, it's sort of a cloud of activity as opposed to that bup, 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 that you got with the other one. Or you can feed it gates. So this is the same example as before. So it's transposing octaves, but rather than doing it in a sort of a increasing or decreasing speed, it's doing it with this sort of more random stochastic rhythm. and a musical example here. So what I'm doing with this one is I'm using it for corpus playback. So I'm loading a corpus here, um, the China one. Now, whenever there's a loud attack, so I, I can set the threshold here, it's gonna trigger a cloud of matches. So it'll, it'll find the nearest match. So by default, I'm finding the nearest match, like normal um, corpus player style, but there's a fork of that that's going through the filter thing. So whenever a match is found, it's creating a a cloud of additional matches, but internally it's doing this um, decay thing where I'm taking the uh, 
using data transpose to take the loudness and the centroid and transpose them down with each hit of the cloud. So it'll find the nearest match. And then when it does this cloud thing, so it's only when there's loud hits, um, it does like a, bup, 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 bup. like it'll, it'll match more samples, but getting dark inquired. So it's almost like a, a random delay type sound, but with the descriptors and then it's sending that back in. And then I'm doing a little uh, variation here just to give it, so it doesn't sound like a, a stuck uh, machine gun snare type sound. So with that first sample, you can kind of hear it a little bit better. This is a relatively small corpus, meaning there isn't a ton of samples in it. So you do get a little bit of a machine gun kind of repeated one, particularly since I've turned round robin off. Um, but you can get this kind of cool, like descending descriptor kind of schmear. Okay. And with all of those, you can use those now with trigger frame. So trigger frame, <coughs> excuse me, trigger frame is similar to um, onset frame and real time frame in that it will um, records into a buffer and you can analyze um, audio in there. But rather than being um, triggered by an onset, which all the other ones are, this one is triggered by a separate input. So I can send audio into it. But in this case, the descriptor analysis is being triggered by a metro. So um, what this is useful for is I'll show you in the musical examples, but sometimes I'm triggering, let's say, a process with one of these, the cloud or bounce or one of these other objects, and I don't need, I know when I'm triggering the event, so I can just use that same trigger to trigger analysis. So rather than triggering a, a random event and then using separate onset detection to detect it, it sort of skips that middleman step, so you don't need to trigger an event with a cloud, send the cloud output into descriptor analysis, and then do the thing again. You can just literally just have it all going together. So this spits out um, a buffer name and a frame to analyze in. So that's kind of what it sends out. But I can do that um, to do stuff like this. So there's a bunch of stuff going on here, but I'll just kind of summarize. So I have that probability thing. So what you're gonna hear in one speaker is, um, I think similar to what I've had in one of the other help files where it's this filtered noise. So um, there's a chance that it kind of does this shape um, of the noise filtered and then going into LPG. And then what I'm doing is sending the audio output of that into trigger frame, triggering that with the same bounce triggers, and then using that to do descriptor matching. So in the other speaker, you'll hear um, the voice corpus matching at the same time. So that sounds like this. So this would work fine if I take the output of this and just run it into, let's say, like, um, onset, uh, SP onset frame or SP descriptors or whatever, and do that as, as I would have, let's say like with previous versions, but what's handy now is that because I'm already triggering events, I know these events are happening. So I'm just using the same event that's triggering this sound to trigger the corresponding analysis. So they'll always be tight. They'll always be accurate. It won't miss one. Like I don't have to set a whole separate set of thresholds to make sure the onset detection is fine. And in this case, you can get this kind of cool uh, thing. And in this one, I'm, I think I'm applying 100% you know, loudness and spectral compensation. So the corpus is getting yeah, further tweaked. So it really sounds a lot like the filtered noise. <laughs> Okay, um, so that's, I think, the new objects. There's a few things that have changed in a couple places. So I'll just kind of show a few of those. So um, Corpus Player. Um, now has um, absolute starts and absolute length things. So before you could. So let's play kind of the first sample here. You know, you could adjust the, the beginning and the length and all that. But when you don't know how, how long your samples is, 
um, it was kind of tricky to always let's say like cut off the first 10 milliseconds so now you can it'd be like i want to cut off the first you know 20 milliseconds or whatever of every sample and it'll it'll do that so every sample regardless of the duration of it will be missing that amount so you can kind of see here in the window maybe i'll make it bigger so it's kind of different each time so depending on how long the sample is it's cutting off more of it um, and since you have two parameters, they sort of stack. So you can do, this is 17% of the beginning plus 50 milliseconds, whatever that number happens to be. Um, and you can also set a, a fixed length. So I'd, let's say I want to play always um, 100 milliseconds. So you can see now it's always 100 milliseconds, but that might be a different amount. Um, for this one's a little, it's a little trickier because the, um, you can't add the two together. So what, what I do with this is um, it'll take the shortest one. So if um, this is shorter, then it'll it'll use that. But if I do the length, um, it'll do nothing unless it's shorter than 800 milliseconds. So for the length, it kind of compares one to the other. It's kind of a tricky thing, but since both parameters are exposed, I needed to do something. So um, essentially you can just leave these be and either use just the start one, if that's what you want, or the percentage one. So that's kind of new. Um, and there's a few other small things in there, but one of the other things I want to show is that if I just make a new patch here, um, all of the objects now have autocomplete stuff. So let's say I have SP onset, I can see all the attributes. So fast ramp down and you can like build these things in, or rather you can just sort of see what they do looking there. Um, on top of that, all the objects also now have, when you open up their help files, like all this stuff here is the same as before, but now we get this, um, well, this reference file, and you also have the C also. So if I open up the reference file for um, SP onset, you can see here that it tells me with a lot of detail what each thing is, what the default value is, um, different things, there's some links in here, et cetera, et cetera, what the inputs and outputs are. You can open the help file from here. Etc. So all the reference stuff is built in, as well as the C also. So I'm in C, um, SP onset. That's also similar to real time frame. So I can jump and open real time frame, and here's all that kind of stuff. So this took quite a lot of time. I've been actually working this for behind the scenes for a few updates because each individual file needs. It doesn't matter. Uh, it took a while. Is, is all you need to know. But yeah, everything has documentation. So um, you can kind of go in there and well, actually, it doesn't work for abstractions. But um, if you do type in objects, you can then, you know, see what the things are and, and type them in and put the, all that stuff in. So um, that's a new thing too. Um, another massive change, which is really behind the scenes, um, but everything is now sample rate agnostic, meaning that uh, when you create a corpus, so if I go to um, corpus create, before it assumed you were um, doing either 44 or 48K as your sampling rate and did analysis accordingly. Now, when you go to analyze a corpus, it, it checks the sample rate of that file. So if you have some files that are 192K um, or if you have a mix, so some files are 44, some files are 90, 90, 96 or whatever. Like if you have different sample rates mixed in, each individual file will get analyzed correctly. So it'll, it'll analyze basically the appropriate amount of time regardless of what the sample rate is. So it's real fussy behind the scenes and then that gets saved in the corpus and you don't have to think about it anymore. So you can basically chuck whatever sample rates you want into analysis. And on the playback end, um, all the descriptor analysis stuff is also sample rate agnostic. So um, every object that you open up, so let's say um, I'm not, because I'm filming a video now, but let's say I was running my sound card at 192K. Um, the descriptors would show correctly. They didn't before. Um, so if you were above 48K sampling rate, it still gave you numbers, but the numbers weren't what they were supposed to be. So um, it was quite a, a bit of work to work out all the weird edge cases with that, but um, all that is to say that um, all the sample ring state uh, stuff works fine for offline analysis and for real-time analysis. So you can run it 192K if you want for real-time stuff and run, analyze your 192K 32-bit sample libraries and everything will be happy. Um, <clears throat> so all that's there in the background. And then um, included in here, this is kind of a little bit of a, of a perk, and I think I'll build it out as we go, but there's some pure data 
um, abstraction. So I've done about seven of the objects with uh, simple help files here, pure data stuff. This is mainly um, eventually to so they can you can do kind of cool stuff on Abella. So all of this is uh, vanilla PD friendly, but that stuff's built in. So you know if you're in pure data, you know go to town. Um, there's a pure data um, channel on the Discord as well. So if, if anybody's into pure data stuff, you know chime in there. It'd be cool to have help to turn these into more. Like I'll also really add some more every time. I don't think I'll do the whole library because it's just it's too many. Um, it's too it's sixty two um, abstractions now, so it's it's quite comprehensive in terms of the size. But there is some kind of stuff in there, and there's some other kind of cool stuff bubbling up in the background. But for now, there's version zero pro eight. Um, loads of new stuff in there. Um, jump on the Discord. Let me know what you think, and enjoy. <laughs>